welcome back everyone. We're here for another research talk. This time I have another good friend and colleague, um, Dr. Megan Chwanski. Megan, just want to say hi. Hello everyone. Um, Megan is a former colleague of mine from the University of Brighton. We worked together, we shared an office together. Um, the, the reason why I've asked Megan to come and have a chat with me today is that some of her work is around social change and Megan has been specifically involved in some of that social change. So in terms of a, a way of thinking about immersive research, it's another good example of some of the, um, the interesting stuff that people can do when they're connected to subcultures and communities and, and all the rest of it. Um, one thing before we get started though, when me and Megan shared an office, um, one of the things that I remember so well about Megan, when we, we have a lot of conversations, I learned a lot from Megan, one of the first things was trying to value work-life balance and if it wasn't for Megan I would not have the work-life balance that I have now so thanks for that Megan I just wanted to kind of semi-embarrass you with that just to get you started. Oh, thank you that's great great to hear. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit wh where you're based um, you know what you do what kind of teaching you do and 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 maybe give us a bit of an outside into insight into some of your 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 research that you that you do. Okay, sure. I'm currently based at Otterbein University, which is a small university in Westerville, Ohio. So that's in the Midwest of the US. Um, I've bounced around quite a bit. So some people have said I've taken some risks in my career, but I feel like everything's led me to this place where I teach sport management. So I currently teach courses or modules on global sports, which is one of my favorite things sport facilities, sport finance, psychology of sport. So we have a broad range um, of courses, or I'm sorry, I'm trying to use the UK language, a broad, ways, a broad range of classes for our course in sport management. I've also taught at University of Kentucky, so in the southern part of the country. Um, Bath, I was at the University of Bath for two years, and then I was at Brighton for a while with, with Dr. Matthews. So. Um, I got interested in my current line of research, probably, I think I've always been interested in what more sport can do. So though I was an athlete and pretty active in sports my whole life, I always had this other side of me that was, I think, a little bookish, a little bit more interested in other storylines um, that could tie into sport, but didn't necessarily have to. So I remember early on, um, my dad would tell me like, you need to play with boys if you want to be better at sports. And I'd get mad and say, but the boys don't pass me the ball when I want to play basketball with them. So I feel like I always had this little spark of fighting back and pushing back against what was expected. And I've tried to like, find opportunities to push back in my own life in different ways, whether that's in sport or out sport, outside of sport, but then also look at organizations in terms of my research that are doing that kind of work as well. And that's broadly coming into kind of an umbrella of sport and social change, some people would call. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess just as an insight, because I think this will be a topic that most people won't be overly aware of. Um, in terms of the, in, before we get into the research, some of the academic ideas, how do we understand social change? The one thing that I always come to with this when I teach this topic is, I find that our students think they can't do anything about the world, they can't change the world. And, and granted, it's, 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 it's challenging, but the fundamental premise that they don't recognize is that society fun does change. It will change. And what is normal now will not be normal tomorrow and in a few years time. So we can maybe affect that change in some ways, but that, that's my kind of very basic understanding. How do we kind of academically start to put some, some nuts and bolts onto that, those ideas? Um, I think when we talk about social change in the academic research, we often maybe see two or three threads. So one would be kind of athlete activism, which we're seeing quite a bit of these days um, in the U.S. and around the world. So athletes using their platform to advocate for either change inside of sport or change outside of sport. So for me, social change within sport, women getting the chance to play sport was a huge um, moment that someone pushed, you know, moved the ball forward, if you will, on that particular issue that allowed me to play. So I always remembered when I played um, that I was part of that movement and saw myself. I might not be making those sweeping changes like other people, but there could be little things that I would say, well, maybe we could get this or maybe we should get an extra coach or whatever the case may be. So I think it's important to try to see what little progress you can help make um, 
and try to manage your expectations about what's possible in terms of social change. But I think those two categories are important to differentiate inside of sport and outside of sport. So maybe advocating for fair, fair um, pay in sport or like we've seen in the NBA and the WNBA looking at Black Lives Matter and things like that. So those are kind of social change examples for the moment. Um, but there's also another umbrella term that you might come across um, called SDP or SFD, Sport for Development and Peace, or Sport for Development. <clears throat> and those two areas also, I would say, fall under Sport for Social Change. And essentially, these are programs in operation around the world that are less concerned with performance in sport and training kids and young people up to reach a certain level and more interested in how sport can be used as a vehicle for other objectives, um, other outcomes. So you'll see sport for social cohesion, sport for peace, and so the programs can be designed with those intentions versus let's make sure all the kids can meet these different standards. Cool. So in terms of um, now linking into your research, I know in terms of the stuff that you've done, but also the stuff that you've been involved in supervising as well, um, can you give us a kind of outline of some of the projects that you've been involved in and, and, and as, I guess specifically um, the, the, the focus on that element of change and, and how that was explored or um, focused on within the work? Sure, I think um, I always say the starting point for me in this line of research was when I decided to take essentially kind of a year off my gap year, which was a little later in life, um, to work for Peace Players in Cyprus. And that was an organization that I worked for for a year that used, as you might be able to tell, bat, well, basketball to bring the two communities in Cyprus, the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots uh, together through the sport of basketball. So I knew that I wanted to study this and I think this is where the immersive research kind of comes through all of my ideas or all of my kind of orientation to research. I felt like I needed to be there to see it firsthand and to immerse myself in that context. You know, I was reading about these programs. I was getting excited about what more sport could do. You know, I had done the traditional kind of training of young athletes, coaching, and that has some rewards. But for me, I was looking for something a little more that would integrate some of my interest in, in activism, but also kind of sport. So Peace Players was great. I was a program director. Um, for a while, worked with different communities, assisted coaches, planned events, so a lot of the sport management stuff. But also you needed that understanding of how you try to help people come together when there's this history of conflict and tension. So I think you needed those soft skills as well. And for me, just to be able to see the challenges that come from especially an outside organization coming in. This was a US-based organization sending a US citizen to help out was really interesting for me to try to think through. What was my role? What was my responsibility? What could I reasonably do and accomplish? So I started there and then moved on to some more academic positions where I had time and space to think about what I had done and what programs were sprouting up elsewhere. So from there, I've taken on different opportunities to, store, to study rather programs in depth and have looked at um, for example, some research I did when I was at Brighton, I went to Delhi, India to study the Goal program, which uses netball for young girls who are typically underserved when it comes to sport and education. And they claim that their program was helping girls change, become more empowered, become more um, aware of their rights. And I, my research question was essentially, how does this work? And is it, actu is it actually working? And if so, how does it work? Yeah. So I did a series of kind of um, interviews with the girls along a colleague of mine, Payush Nimitra. We worked on this project together and we just talked to the girls over the course of the program to understand how they saw themselves changing and what they saw as their next steps, their future, because the program was meant to kind of plant these seeds for future success. Um, so I'll leave it there, but I know you maybe want to talk a little bit about the outcomes or. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. I think um, just as a, I, I, as you, as you remember from us teaching together, I'm very, very critical of these ideas that sport can, mm -hmm. can, can be good in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. As I know you are, um, having not done work on it, it gives me the opportunity to be um, 
mean about sport basically a lot of the time um so i think when we work together it works quite well because i, I you know I, I give the i give the dark side and you kind of like bring it around yeah chris is kind of right but also he's wrong we can do it this way um so i think that's the first thing that's coming into my mind i'm trying to hold off on some of those questions cause i think they probably come in better at the end but let's let's talk first let's stick with the kind of immer immersive element so one of the, well I'll, I'll i'll combine the two one of the critiques of the research which tries to kind of measure social change and measure through social change through sport as well is that the people who are often doing the research are involved in delivering the project. There's a clear issue with bias. Um, and the example from my sport is that when they, when a, a funding body gives some money to a boxing club, um, the, the coaches ask the kids, you know, did you desist from crime? Did you stop smoking weed? And they're like, yes, sir. No, sir. Of course I did. Yeah. Yeah. And then that gets reported as, as data and it's obviously problematic. So I guess the first thing is to kind of just pick through some of the problems that there are of being immersed in that space and, and being, you know, broadly pro sport as am I in, in the end, but, and then also how you tackle that, that closeness and, and, and what then eventually what the strengths are with being so close. Yeah. I mean, I think um, being so close, you, you get to see, what do, I don't know, would you say warts and all in the UK? You get to see everything of the good and the bad. Um, so we would go, I mean, I think first off getting access to the program like we had was, that's a hard part for researchers to, to do. So we had pretty much full access to whatever we wanted. We would go to watch the girls in their um, training sessions, their school sessions. They were always very excited when we came and would run up to us. So it was kind of a, a nice atmosphere. Um, I guess you could say that we are we as researchers or people were um, well re well received, which I think is always always a big hurdle. Um, but I think what we learned, and what I was also hoping to learn, is kind of a, an add-on question: is how can we make these programs better? I think you're right to say there's a lot of problems with these, and I never go in totally naive that these are going to actually meet all the outcomes or objectives that these programs have set. But I, I kind of think about how they're moving towards these aims and how I see my responsibility as a research to not only report on what I've found or what I've seen, but also help that program get better. And that may, some people may say that's a conflict of interest. I think it's just translating your research into really tangible um, outcomes for a program. So they're giving their time. They want to learn something, hopefully. They just don't want you to stamp and say everything's great. So we would debrief with the, the program. We sent them a report. Um, we did have some uncomfortable moments. I won't go into some of those, but things that we saw that we were both a little, uh, how do we handle this? You know, so as researchers, you encounter those moments and you try to make the best choices. But, you know, I do think there was room for improvement. I think there were a lot of constraints to what they were even trying to do. And at the end of the day, I think if these kind of projects were easy, people would be doing them already. You know, they're really hard context. Um, to work in for a variety of reasons. So I try to measure success, not only with, um, again, how well, or if I'm scaling the, or measuring them on a certain scale, how well they're doing, but also are they moving in the general direction in light of all the constraints or challenges. So I think that's also where you get the immersive ethnographic picture. It's like, okay, one of the girls have to take the Metro to get to the school itself. You walk through, kind of very stereotypical, maybe Indian, lower income setting through cows, animals, people, someone's guarding the door and they don't want to let you in. And so it's just like, even to get to the school is like an accomplishment in my mind in some ways for, for some of these young people then to build in the, the extra netball, which was the first time for a lot of them and the other things that they were doing was a win. So I, maybe I'm an easy grader or an easy marker, but I think we need to keep those into keep those in mind as well when you're evaluating. Yeah, and I guess um, I, I I know the work that you've done, so I'm aware that there will have been a mixture of methods used at various times. And I guess what I think maybe some people wouldn't recognise would be how you use different methods, observations, maybe chats and counting numbers of people or whatever to try and come about with some. I don't even want to say best estimate, but some some data to say, look, here's where this is good and some bad, and here's some improvements. But mm -hmm. could you talk to that maybe the the way that you go about trying to demonstrate some of your findings? 
Sure, I think in this season, this uh, case study in Delhi as an example would, would highlight some of what you're talking about because we had a number of challenges. Um, mainly language was a bit of a barrier. So we were told that, you know, the girls, I don't speak, I speak a little Spanish, but English is my main language. And they were, we were told the girls would speak English pretty well, and that wasn't the case. So Payoshni had to really step up and speak in Hindi and translate for me. And so we had this complicated issue from the start. We planned to do focus groups and interviews, and we did do those. I think those were supplemented by other methods that we chose to do, which were the observations, as you noted. We also did some more um, creative methods. So we had the girls draw pictures of what they'd like to be in the future and kind of talk th talk us through their future aspirations. Again, one of the aims was that the girls developed kind of a vision of what is possible for their futures as opposed to maybe what they would come in with um, regularly. We interviewed some of the peer coaches. So again, the focus is on the girls, but we interviewed some of the ones who were working with the girls directly to try to understand how they saw things on the ground. Um, and I mean, those were the kind of main uh, unique, I guess, or different methods. We did also did one kind of on the <laughs> spur of the moment um, innovation or tweak to one of our methods and some of the girls wanted to do interviews of each other. So we let them kind of do that a little bit and that brought up some other interesting points. We didn't plan that going in, but I think it it was part of this message of empowerment and seeing them in different roles and trying out different ideas. So that actually became a, a really nice moment um, to kind of step back, not get so fixated on. We didn't have this, you know, planned out at the start and say, like, this is a moment that we need to take advantage of and it's going to give us some different perspectives because we are not young 13, 14 year old girls from Delhi growing up in this space. So our vantage point on what we think is important might be quite different than what the girls think. So yeah. I think just being flexible in the moment is also a key key takeaway from that experience for me. Yeah, that's cool. I, I talk about this in a, another video on the on the website, which I'll, I'll link in about this sort of research being em emergent from the from the from the, the sample, the the constraints and and I think when when people go into the notion of doing science, it's right. What's my system? Uh, you know, how what are my questions I'm going to ask? And I can't break from that, especially at undergraduate level. I think it's mm -hmm. very much true. What so so I can ask different questions. So well, if if you need to, you do. Um, and that kind of flexibility and fluidity is something that I guess comes with a bit of time and a bit of skill, a bit of experience. You know, you can do that and let, and relaxation as well. Um, but an essential part of a project like this, right? I mean, you can't go into a project like this and not let things emerge and, and, and data collection methods emerge over time. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And it shows this notion of immersion isn't just, you know, I'm going to just be in this subculture and I'm just going to sit there and watch stuff. I mean, that's really useful. But you have to ask pe people's questions, don't you? Have to, you have to ask questions about sort of things and uh, how someone's what what did that behavior mean that you just did and i think it's this but is it that and those sort of things so in terms of we, we've kind of covered some of the strengths there what maybe this isn't something that you experienced in this project but it's certainly a case in other areas what are some of the problems with people being involved in these spaces and doing the research on them um i think this a big problem that we had was well, in some ways um, I'm a white woman I identify as a white woman and I was very noticeable in Delhi so I almost um, distracted from the research sometimes because I would go into the school and then all of the students would come and like be very close I almost felt like a celebrity they would like look at me and kind of scout me out a little and then I was always turning heads so I didn't blend in I think sometimes you want to just kind of sit in and immerse yourself and not stick out and I clearly stuck out stuck out because my white skin I was also quite tall <laughs> compared to a lot of the younger people and I had short hair for a woman which was also very unusual so I, I was um, not so easily disguised and kind of you know um, able to just take it all in because I drew a lot of attention. So I think this is a larger issue for me about who should be in some of these spaces and who should be studying these these kind of programs. I think there's a lot of work, academic work in 
sport for development and sport for peace that's asking questions about <clears throat> global north volunteers um, global north researchers a lot of the programs we would say are in the global south but the research is coming from uh, uk europe um, us and so there's been a necessary question about who should be doing this research what kind of partnership should we be forming um, so that's really taken that to heart and that, that question would come up a lot for me just in general. Um, it's like, we have a lot of problems in the US. Why do you feel like you need to go elsewhere to help people solve their problems? Because, you know, stay in your own community. So I think more recently I've taken that to heart since coming back to Ohio, which is my home state. I've thought about, well, I've been uh, asked to work with a local um, woman and, and starting a group for Somali women and girls. We have a large um, population of Somalis in Columbus. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. I wouldn't know what I know if I hadn't done those experiences and had those research opportunities. So I'm grateful for that. And I also recognize the critiques with me, the white researcher, going to study the other. And I think that you need to be very attuned to that and try to do take the necessary steps to to address that or at least think through how you're going to handle that situation. Yeah, and we can read about that as much as we like, but until we find that the individual specifics of that situation, it, who knows how to manage it and mitigate it? And yeah. It's so challenging. I think we all know these things are potential and then we have them happen to us. It's like, oh, okay, that's what that means. Those words that I wrote that, that I read that time or even wrote as well, this is what this means. And all of the talks that I've had with people around this have, have, have shone the light on those moments of like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or I did do that, and oh, I could have done that better, I didn't think about that. It's the right of passage, right? It's, yeah. you know, we've got to try and tread carefully, but at the same time, you've got to tread, you've got to go forward, and you've got to make mistakes, and then you have to reflect and learn on them. Yeah. I think the funniest moment along those lines was not even, when I was in Cyprus, um, some people thought I was in the CIA, like a spy and I, I never had thought like I knew there would probably be concerns and then I heard this come out and I don't know if it was in jest or in reality but I was like oh my god I think I'm, the CIA. So I'm not in the CIA but you know it, you have to be attuned to that and kind of take the larger message about like there might be legitimate concerns or there's a past history that maybe you weren't aware of that you're now involved in so take those concerns and questions to heart and do what you can to mitigate i suppose yeah i've ju just reviewed a paper recently and it was talking about the, the 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 researcher was connected to the community in some way therefore that's it fine like no problems they interpreted everything yeah. the same and I'm, i was like oh, well, well hold on a minute one what's the connection you know is it a real one it's actually in, I, I won't go into detail because it's a, a peer review but a a, a a a gym culture of some sort and I was like, well, I know gym cultures where that sort of person you're describing is ridiculed. And this, is, this happens in, uh, in a lot of different research where people kind of make assumptions and statements about researchers being accepted. Well, where's, where's your evidence? How can, you, how can you demonstrate that? And it might just be a feeling, it might be a sense, but if that is the case, then you, I think in, when we write this up, we have to say that. You know, I felt accepted. I always felt accepted in boxing clubs. But of course I was ridiculed at different times. Of course I was bullied at different times and didn't even notice it was happening. And that's a lot of reflection on, on our own kind of um, fallibilities of researchers that's needed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and especially when we're in these kind of complex social situations. And mine are relatively simple for me to read because they're always Western, usually Western and male. So at least it's a language that I'm used to. You're literally in a different language and a different culture. To be able to kind of, second guess what someone with such a different background is thinking about you is so difficult um and that kind of reflection is important so just kind of just to just to move things on a little um if, if you were to have a a young scholar come and say to you i want to go and do research it like this model i want to go somewhere where um i'm not a part of that culture i'm not a part of that space um have you got and i don't i don't like the phrase but i'm going to do it anyway have you got any top tips <laughs> What, what, what do you say to that person when they say, I don't know what to do? How do you, how do you get them to, to go and start trying to get into those sort of subcultures? Um, I think if they really have an interest in this broad area of support for development and peace, I would look at some of the, the programming 
first versus the location maybe. I think sometimes we're driven by um, <clears throat> the opportunity to travel through some of these experiences and I feel like that needs to be part of the equation. You want to go to a place where you might feel comfortable and you know roughly the culture that you're moving into, but I think the program should drive the decision. Um, so look at what their mission is, look at how they're maybe uh, meeting or not meeting their objectives, think about kind of how they talk about the work that they're trying to do. Um, and then there, there are some programs that do offer uh, like placements or short-term visits where you're working in some capacity. So, Again, there's critiques of these kind of setups and I think they're legitimate. And I also think these programs are massively underfunded and need a lot of support. Um, I know, I think when I, yeah, when I was at Bath, they had some exchanges in Zambia with a number of different um, UK universities. So there are opportunities and even at Brighton with obviously with Football for Peace, they had some students traveling. Um, getting some exposure through some of these more formal programs might be a first step before thinking, Okay, I'm going to go in and do this research because you want to understand if the research will make sense both for the organization and for um, kind of their objectives and not just your interest in studying something or a particular topic. And I have heard from programs that say like, yeah, we get a lot of emails about master, postgrad students, PhD students who want to study our program and it takes a lot of time for us to work with them and we're already feeling stretched. So finding a way to actually work with an organization if research is your ultimate goal to make sure it's going to benefit them. Yeah. I think that's a responsible thing to do. Yeah, for sure. And it's almost, um, it's ensuring, it's moving away from this notion that, 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 participants owe us something in some sort of way researchers and it's the complete opposite we are, owe our participants so much and we and i think especially as you pointed out we owe them to try and help help them do whatever they want to do better and what that is you know as long as we can as long as it's ethical we want to try and help them with that as much as possible mm -hmm. and that shift in balance helps the young people going into these sort of spaces contribute and if they contribute, they'll probably be accepted in some way. And then hopefully the research can, can benefit from that. So two questions before we kind of wrap up a little um, about, about research and where people go in terms of reading and thinking. Um, where do you send people for research methods? Um, if, if, you, if you have someone say, right, I want to do something on social change or whatever, where do you go for a research methods thing? A, a introductory text or something a bit more... Um, uh, something more specific I don't know wherever you want to take that answer hmm. Question, sorry. yeah I would say um, I'm just looking back at my bookcase <laughs> I think I've got one yeah if I can go get it actually for a second yeah, I use a visual go. aid just a second always good to have some um, some props brought live onto uh, onto the program onto this the, works onto well the, yeah, um, I don't just in a little filler there. I was practicing my uh, TV presentation bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't plan that. I should have this. Um, well, I always kind of identify myself as a feminist researcher. So I would typically, and, and a lot of people who come to me have interest in, in girls and women's experiences in sports. It's kind of been what I've carved a little bit of a, an area in, in terms of my broad research agenda. But this is one book that was really important to me. I don't know if you can see it called Muddying the Waters. I think the screen is, but it's co-authoring feminisms across scholarship and activism. So kind of, you know, what we're talking about today. And this is uh, a scholar who worked with an organization in India and co-created a research, um, designed and co-created a research product that benefited not only her, she's an academic at Michigan, I believe, I'm sorry, Minnesota in the U.S., but also the organization that she was working with, which for me is like, that's what I want to do. I don't feel like I've, I don't have a book length um, product or research output that looks like that, but that's what I'm always trying to do. I feel like that's, as you said, kind of our responsibility to the participants or the co, um, co collaborators that we're working with in the field to make sure that their experience is valued, not only for, for our maybe academic purposes, but also for the livelihood that they might seek or the work that they're doing. So that's outside of sport. Um, in sport, I would say starting with some general, if you're just starting to do research, starting with some general text to get the 
broad um, understanding of what research is. Qualitative research, depending on your domain, export management in the US, I would say it's a little less focused on qualitative research. So building up your own understanding of that might be necessary. So no particular names come to mind. I think starting with kind of a broad um, understanding of research. Is yeah, that, a good text, place to that, start. Text, that text that you've mentioned sounds sounds great because it's, it's something that we've, we don't talk enough about. And it's this this notion of co-production, no, not only the co-production of knowledge, which is something that I do talk about, but the co-production of projects. Mm -hmm. Again, the kind of the ivory towers, I'm a scientist, I'm going to do this and I'm going to measure that. It, it doesn't make sense for us in social science because we're yeah. working with people. Um, and there is a legacy within social science of, of not valuing the people that you're the researching. Um, so that that's an essential thing for this sort of area. I mean, it's essential for all of us. But and then just in terms of social change, what, what what's the kind of key reading in social change? Um, for me, in social change, the people that I'm reading, I fall more into the sport for development. <clears throat> excuse me, arm of things. So some scholars from Canada, Simon Darnell, Lindsay Hayhurst. Those are folks I'm always looking at to see what they're coming up with. Some of the big names. I've written and worked a bit with Holly Thorpe in New Zealand, and I think her work is really interesting and exciting for a lot of students because she's looking at extending some of the activism questions in sport or social change questions in sport and looking at action sport. So skateboarding, um, surfing, there's some programs that try to use surf. Um, <clears throat> Waves for Change is one organization that uses surfing, <clears throat> excuse me. So those are some of the people that I refer students to and they, I like them because their work is very um, innovative. So Lindsay does some great photo voice approaches with some of her work in sport for development. And um, Holly's been really leading the way with some of the skateboarding research in this area, the action sports for change as she wants to kind of coin it. And I think that's been, again, really useful for students to kind of think and get excited. I think that's an important part of starting research is getting that excitement that fire going in you to see what others yeah. have done is sometimes helps that and now i need you to explain what photo voice is because i know there's going to be people <laughs> listening going photo voice what's photo voice this sounds amazing yeah i mean just briefly i would say it's just another way to get your participants to kind of share their insights their experiences and you use photos so you can do it i think i've seen it do, done in a few ways one is you can actually give them cameras, have them take photos of a certain, what's your day like? What does freedom mean to you? Um, how does skateboarding matter? And then you develop those photos and they help talk you through it. And it just becomes a tool. If you think about especially working with younger people and the thought of doing a one-on-one -on -one interview can be quite intense. So you wanna find different ways of getting them to tell stories, talk about their lives that maybe take away that <clears throat> pressure. And that's one approach. Um, I've also seen it used with, let's say, older people, if I can use that. Maybe you have photos from their life and you're just sharing and looking at those photos together and, again, reminiscing, talking about some of the themes that you want to get at, but a less, sometimes interviews can seem quite confrontational and people feel inclined, right? We know that they feel inclined to give us certain answers and this just takes the pressure off a little bit. So I think it's a useful tool to consider. Yeah, sounds great. I've never used it, but I've heard of a project um, I forget the young lad's name, unfortunately, but it's uh, Debbie Jump's um, mm -hmm. student up in uh, MMU who's looking at rugby. Really nice lad, and he did photo listation basically with some students who are mm -hmm. desisting from crime in rugby. They just use their phones. They just mm -hmm. just send mm -hmm. photos in. <laughs> right. And um, I think I'm not. I think this is yeah. This is fine to mention because he used it in a slide, so it's fine. But uh, yes, yeah, someone sent just in a picture of a machete. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so we are dealing with some kind of serious issues here as well so we just just i just imagine the the way in which young people and you know a lot of my work is well a lot of my work is with men but i speak a lot to young boys whether it's at school or, um, at university or, or or whatever and and i know that some of them just tr struggle to speak you know mm -hmm. young people in general but my experience with boys and they struggle to speak and when you I, something that I have to reflect on quite a lot is when I'm in an interview situation, what someone thinks of someone with tattoos all over the face and a big beard who's 100 kilos. You know, what, what does that mm -hmm. mean to someone? It means a lot of things mm -hmm. to a lot of people. And if you can offset that in some way by saying, look, 
go and take some photos then tell me about them instantly right. it's it's not it, it breaks that barrier down to some degree mm -hmm. um, no matter how 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 nice you are or how you present yourself if you look a certain way people will think a certain thing i think it's something sure. to be aware of, that i have to be aware of anyway mm -hmm. okay cool i think we're about there really in terms of um we've both got things to do unfortunately haven't we we could have thought for a lot longer <laughs> yes. um, is there anything else you want to say before we finish off um i would just say that i think for me this um this line of research has been really rewarding. I think it's made me reflect on my location, my position as a researcher, as an athlete. My assumptions that I make that I can connect with people through sport have been challenged and turned on their head a little bit, um, but it hasn't been boring. And it's been something that I hope some of you will consider looking into um, as much as, you know, there are some hesitations with maybe traveling to do research or being an outsider, I think there's ways to navigate that. Um, it'll take a little bit more time, I think, to think through and work through the logistics with maybe an, an organization that would like to work with you. But it's been very rewarding and, um, and I think this is really important work. Um, so not very really profound, but I just wanna give you a little bit of encouragement to, to keep on with um, exploring what's out there in this particular area of sport for social change. And I'll just add a, a, a slightly pragmatic note to that as well, that a lot of our students want to stay involved in sport, want to study sport, and we know where the money is shifting gradually. It's in, in sport for health, it's physical activity, and it's sport for a rare variety of social change models, um, especially in the UK now, um, crime and desistance and things like that have been put into public health agendas. So there's there's money there. So this is a this is something that our, our students should be looking at and going okay well the world of pro sport is 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 challenging at the best of times to get into but where we use sport in these kind of ways is in, is is a, is a growth area again which i think is fantastic so so not only can it be fantastic in the way you've presented it but a, a, a probably a, a, a safer bet than trying to go and work for you know whatever daft premier league team or whatever <laughs> Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much, Megan. Appreciate your time. Um, I will put the links to those um, to the book, especially that you mentioned, and, and maybe your your um, how people can follow you and follow your work or something on in this post. Thanks so much again. Appreciate it, and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, thank you.